This is the fastest monitor I have ever tested and that's coming from someone who's reviewed over 250 different panels. It's called the Asus ROG Swift Pro PG248QP which sports a 24.1 inch ETN 540Hz display. It also has ULMB2 support, adaptive sync technologies thanks to the built-in G-Sync module, therefore giving it the full VR range, and it also has Display HDR 400 certification. Now this full HD monitor, yes indeed 1920 by 1080 comes in at a whopping £1,000 in the UK and $900 in the US. Absolutely mind-boggling price. Now in this review you can see if it's actually worth its price tag and how it competes with some of the top tier gaming monitors out there on the market. Now to kick off I would like to point out something extremely important and that's the fact that this monitor requires a really beefy PC setup with a certain list of requirements. So much so that the manufacturer recommends an Intel i9-13900K with an RTX 4070 as a bare minimum. Now if that hasn't put you off you'll also have to be running Windows 11 with the latest Kratos build in order for you to access 540Hz. The reason behind this is if for example you're like myself running Windows 10 you'll be capped at 500Hz which is its native refresh rate. So some food for thought before you go out and buy this monitor with your hard-earned money because there are certain requirements which is the first I've ever come across when it comes to reviewing a monitor. So with all that in mind with the monitor running at 500Hz on my Windows 10 machine I put it through its paces and here I had its input lag objectively tested at just 1.1 milliseconds. While it might not look too good on this graph it is actually still phenomenally good. Indeed over here while playing a game such as Counter-Strike 2 I felt that my mouse inputs were absolutely flawless and no issues whatsoever while playing a hardcore competitive game. Now furthermore you have actually got the Nvidia Reflex Analyzer tool. Now this will require you to have the monitor plugged in via the USB Type-B to Type-A cable and your mouse connected directly up to the monitor's USB Type-A port. Here it will allow you to give you a measurement of your overall latency of your PC or indeed your mouse. Now it's not exactly something to really be shouting about because quite frankly I don't really see the point of the NVIDIA Reflex Analyzer tool other than just give you some numbers on your screen. But still it's there for you to use if you so wish. Now in terms of the overall response time of this monitor this is where things got really interesting. Here it has got a few different overdrive modes that you can select. Via the OST you can choose Off, Normal, Esports and Extreme. Now in this respect I had this objective test done via the OSRTD tool and here you can see with the overdrive set to off the average initial time which translates to the average D2G which is often referred to by manufacturers tested at 3.6 milliseconds which is actually not all that impressive for a 500 hz monitor. Indeed you can see that the percent in window sits at just 20% but wait things get really impressive when you dial it to its normal overdrive mode which is the one that I would actually suggest because here the average initial time drops down to a stonkingly low 1.43 milliseconds with the percent in window sitting at an extremely impressive 90% which is pretty much unheard of for most LCD panels. Furthermore you can see the RGB overshoot is kept down to a complete bare minimum. Now if you were to go on the eSports mode this will be playable on a game like Counter Strike 2 however on a game like Valorant it might be a little bit too visually impairing and that's because the RGB overshoot becomes a little bit more noticeable. However on the flip side you have got the average initial time dropping down even further to 1.26 milliseconds. Now to make the monitor even faster you can go on the extreme mode preset. This drops down the average initial time to just 1.07 milliseconds which is the fastest LCD monitor that I've ever tested to date. With that said however the RGB overshoot becomes unacceptable at least in my eyes. See while playing a game like Counter Strike 2 I felt that it really threw me off. Now to visually give you a demonstration of this you can see the UFO ghosting test. Indeed over here you can see that the off, normal and esports modes actually do pretty well. Again as a recommendation the normal preset is what I actually ended up using. However you can see that the extreme mode preset isn't too far behind but there is a little bit more inverse ghosting towards the lighter shades. And yes it is going to be noticeable specifically when you're playing more graphically intense games. Now elsewhere you do also have the ability to even better the motion and clarity and that's thanks to the fantastic use of ULMB2. This gives you a variable overdrive as well therefore giving you a fantastic visual experience while giving you great motion clarity. You also have the ability to customize the behavior via adjusting the pulse width and the offset. Something that you might want to do for example if you just want to adjust the brightness. 
Now it's just worth noting over here that the overdrive mode will be locked via the OSD, but as I did mention, it has got a variable overdrive. So effectively, it's not something you'll have to worry about. And in my case, while playing a game like Counter-Strike 2, I felt that ULMB2 mode actually did improve the overall motion clarity. Although it wasn't exactly a night and day difference with having it disabled, because this ETN panel does a phenomenal job regardless. Furthermore, ULMB2 mode can operate at the maximum refresh rate, 500 or 540 hertz, which is absolutely fantastic to see. Unlike some older alternatives out there which were limiting you at a certain refresh rate, this is not the case with this Asus monitor. And yes indeed, the overall differences between having it on and off are minimal, at least in the grand scheme of things, I still think it's great to see that you have got a great sort of versatility. And this makes it arguably one of the best monitors when it comes to motion clarity in its class beating the likes of OLED, traditional TN, IPS or VA panels. I don't think anything really comes close to this sort of motion clarity and couple this with the 500 or 540 hertz refresh rate means that you're going to get a fantastic buttery smooth experience while also being able to track your enemies without any sort of visual impairment. Aside from hardcore competitive gaming, how does the monitor do elsewhere? Well, on the notion of ULMB2, it cannot be used simultaneously with adaptive sync technologies. In other words, AMD FreeSync or Nvidia G-Sync. It doesn't really bother me in the slightest as a hardcore competitive gamer because I don't want to be capping my frames nor incurring any sort of extra input lag. Nonetheless, it's just something I thought I should highlight because other Asus monitors offer ELMB sync, allowing the both technologies to be running in tandem, but that's not the case on this particular monitor. In terms of its VR technology, it has got a built-in G-Sync module, therefore giving the full VR range from 1 to 500Hz on an AMD graphics card and 1 to 540Hz on an NVIDIA graphics card, which is absolutely fantastic, giving you a tear-free gaming experience no matter what refresh rate you're actually going to be able to run. Now to test this, I plugged in the monitor via DisplayPort to my RTX 3080, and here I had no problems running the NVIDIA Pendulum demo, where I didn't incur any sort of black screen issues or flickering. Furthermore, I was able to run 1080p, 500Hz, NVIDIA G-Sync and HDR all simultaneously on a game like Destiny 2, which therefore gave me a fantastic tear-free gaming experience. Now here it does have Display HDR 400 certification, which is nothing really to go shouting about. Indeed over here it's the lowest tier of certification that they can achieve, and it cannot compete with monitors that have Display HDR 600 certification or above, or full array local dimming, or let alone OLEDs. Still, over here I don't suspect HDR is going to be the really key selling point of this monitor, but it's just something I thought I should highlight. Furthermore, via the monitor's OSD you've got a variable backlight control which you can adjust, and this can be done in both HDR and SDR. Again, it's not something that's going to give you a lifelike or indeed a game-changing experience like you'd find on some full array local dimming monitors, but it's just again something I thought I should point out in this review. So past its impressive gaming credentials, what about when it comes to the overall image quality? Well here it has got a flat 24.1 inch ETN panel, which has got actually a pretty aggressive matte coating to it, and therefore you can notice a little bit of graininess to it. Now it's not exactly going to throw you off, but it's just something I thought I should mention. Furthermore over here it has also got pretty poor viewing angles due to the overall panel technology. It's not going to be a problem if you're going to be sat head on to the monitor, but of course it's just something to be mindful about if you're going to be comparing it with some other panel monitor technologies. Now it has got a dedicated sRGB emulation mode with an sRGB gamma clamp and an sRGB gamma curve, which is all very much appreciated. However it's worth noting that in said mode it will lock the overall brightness. Now via my calibrators I noticed a 96.2% sRGB gamma coverage and a gamma volume of 101.5%. Below you can see how it compares to the sRGB standard. The average delta E sits at a pretty impressive 1.66 and a maximum of 3.29, which is actually pretty good for a TN panel. The test and contrast ratio is similarly impressive at 1,235 to 1, competing with even IPS panels. As for its measured white point, it's pretty much bang on to the 6,504 Kelvin target at 6,452 Kelvin at 100%. As for its gamma curve, it's pretty close to the 2.2 standard. Now, I don't suspect most people will be editing in the sRGB color space with its ETN panel, so therefore you might want to unlock the wider color gamut of this monitor. Therefore, going on the scenery mode, which will also give you full brightness controls, and for example, on the wider color gamut mode, which can be selected via the monitor's OSD. Now here in said mode, I had it tested with its gamma coverage and gamma volume positively affecting the Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 modes. Below you can see how it compares to the Adobe RGB mode, not to be confused with the sRGB mode that I previously referenced. 
Similarly over here, the average delta E and the maximum delta E are negatively affected at 3.62 and 9.13. Indeed over here, it can't exactly be used for editing in the Adobe RGB color space. Now its tested contrast ratio does not change, while its measured white point is pretty close again at 6,447 Kelvin at 100%. Its gamma curve unfortunately here is a little bit affected in comparison to the 2.2 standard, but it's not too severe and still is very much acceptable. Now, what is also very agreeable is in terms of the overall peak brightness. Here, I noted a maximum of 452 nits with HDR, and that is with variable backlight enabled. With it disabled, it drops down to 426 nits. It's still very impressive in SDR, getting up to 448 nits with variable backlight, and with it disabled, 432 nits. sRGB brightness, however, is actually pretty dim at 168 nits, while the ULMB2 brightness with the pulse width set at 100 sits at a very high 333 nits, making it very much usable. However, it can drop all the way down to 34 nits with ULMB2 mode, or of course, if you disable it in SDR, it will get down all the way to 30 nits. Now, given it's a TN panel, the overall backlight bleed is actually pretty minimal, and you can see over here, these were tests done at maximum brightness in a completely pitch black room. Furthermore, over here, the overall brightness uniformity is actually very good. Again, this is a pretty small panel, so it should be not very hard to achieve, but it's still great to see that my tested panel actually did fare very well. So past all these tests, I would like to have a quick word about the monitor's build quality. And here it's actually got a three side borderless design with a relatively thin bottom bezel. Therefore, meaning this 24.1 inch display will not actually take too much space on your desk. I also really love the intuitive design of the stand. It can be expanded to have a slightly wider profile or actually be brought in to make it suitable for those certain esports gamers who want to have their keyboard or mice closer to the monitor. Great thinking from the manufacturer and quite intuitive design as well. Furthermore, at the top of the stand, you've got a small little screw thread which allows you to, for example, plug in a webcam. Now, as for the monitor stand itself, it's also very sturdy and it provides you height, tilt, pivot and swivel adjustments, which is also very much appreciated, giving you good sort of ergonomics and versatility. Now, apart from all of that, you have also got the ability to adjust the monitor settings via the OSD. And this can be done via a set of buttons that are found behind the monitor. Here, you will find a very comprehensively laid out OSD with a plethora of different options, all of which are actually very much intuitively done and therefore makes it very easy to adjust certain settings on the fly. Now here, you will also potentially notice a USB audio setting. And indeed over here, if you have plugged in the USB type B to type A cable from the monitor, you'll be able to access high res audio playback. This gives you the ESS codec and gives you playback at up to 32-bit 384, which is actually quite a rarity in a monitor space. Now, in case you're wondering, no, the monitor does not have any built-in speakers. However, the audio is routed via the 3.5 millimeter jack. Now on the subject of inputs, you have got two HDMI 2.0 ports and a singular DisplayPort 1.4 input with DSC. Now here, the DisplayPort 1.4 is gonna be what you want to use because over HDMI it is capped at 240 hertz. However, over DisplayPort, you'll be able to output the full 540 hertz or 500 hertz if you're on Windows 10 and also enable HDR with the likes of NVIDIA G-Sync. So with all that in mind, it brings me onto my verdict. And here I feel that this monitor appeals to a certain niche. Hardcore esports gamers with a high disposable income, not only to buy the monitor in the first place, but also to have an appropriate PC setup. But if you do fall in that category, you'll find that this monitor is pretty much uncontested, be it in terms of its refresh rate, its input lag, its response time, or of course the phenomenal motion clarity that you're getting with that ETN panel. As a result of this, it gets my performance award. However, if you fall elsewhere, or even you are like myself, and you're going to be using the monitor for productivity use, and also just do not have that much amount of money to spend on a monitor, you might want to look at some of the alternatives, from 1440p high refresh rate monitors, or even high refresh rate 1080p monitors, where, for example, you've got 240Hz or even 360Hz monitors, some of which I've reviewed and will be down in the description below for your own consideration. Now, I'd be curious to know if you would splash out this sort of money on this monitor and if you can even run it in the first place. I'd be curious, so let me know down below. Now, if you have liked this independent detail review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated and allows me to continue delivering honest reviews like this one. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.